appreciate that prayer as you do and those kind words and I know you're tired you've been concentrating ever since last Sunday this began three days a night that's four days a night you made another little slip Brother David said it's been a long three days and nights. Well, at OCC, a young man has just come from the Philippine Islands and he's having difficulty with English. He came the other day and said, what did that student mean when he said it's been a long day? He said, are there 26 hours in a day? I know that the nights have been short for these people that have worked so zealously and avidly. But I'm proud of Brother David, Brother Goldman, and these that have put so much into it, why have they done it? Because they believe the Bible produces strong churches. And they believe that the preaching of the word will not return to him void, but will accomplish the purpose for which it's sent. Isaiah 53, 11. He believes that. This church believes that. But these men who've been active in the details could not have done what they've done without help. The help first of the elders, and then the help of every member of these ladies that have given their time and energy, as well as others. So all of us are grateful, we who have come from other places, and we are benefited, we are edified, and we shall all leave profited because of our being with you. Indeed, the world is in a bad shape, but there are lots of good people. The foundation of God standeth sure, Second Timothy 2.19, having this certification as it were written on the cornerstone. The Lord knows them that are his. And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Two certifications written on the cornerstone. Some think he was talking about the church. I don't know. But whoever it is, it's solid and sure non-flexible, invariable, certain, two great facts. The Lord knows them, but he is each one who's put his hand in Jesus' hand and is keeping it there. Regardless of what others do, the Lord knows them, but he is. And he calls them all by name. You're worth something to him. You're precious to him. For there is a time, Malachi 3.17, no, it's not over yet, all the Old Testament. All been fulfilled about Jesus, but yet, there is a day coming when those that reverence the name of the Lord, who call upon his name, and who talk one to another, said Malachi, that day when the Lord makes up his jewels, when he claims those that are his, and you are counting on being one of those, thank God for it. So we are profited it, all of us visitors, by rubbing shoulders with godly people who mean business about religion. The Bible, the producer of strong churches, This book contains the mind of God, the state of man, the way of salvation, the doom of sinners, the happiness of believers. Its doctrines are holy, 
Its precepts are binding. Its histories are true. Its decisions immutable. Read it to be wise. Believe it to be safe. Practice it to be holy. It contains light to direct you, food to support you, comfort to cheer you. It is the pilgrim's staff, the pilot's compass, the soldier's sword, and the Christian's charter. Christ is its object, our good is design, and the glory of God its end. It should fill the memory, rule the heart, guide the feet. Read it slowly, frequently, prayerfully. It is a mine of wealth, a river of pleasure, and a paradise of glory. It is given to you in this life, will be opened at the judgment, and will be remembered forever. It is your Bible. I do not know who wrote those succinct and pointed and beautiful words. I first read them on C.R. Nichols' Pocket Encyclopedia when I was about 12 years old. They touched my heart then. They have ever since. They tell you something. And then after I was preaching, I heard a gospel preacher give a description of the Bible that touched my heart again. And he said, Many years ago I entered into the wonderful temple of God's revelation. I walked down through the Old Testament art gallery, and there I saw hanging on the walls the pictures of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And then I walked into the music room of the Psalms where the Spirit of God played upon the keyboard of nature and brought forth the dirge-like wails of the weeping prophet Jeremiah to the grand impassioned strains of Isaiah, the gospel prophet, till it seemed that every harp and reed in God's organ of nature responded to the tuneful touch of David, the sweet singer of Israel. And then I walked into the chapel of Ecclesiastes, where the voice of the preacher was heard. And I passed into the conservatory of Sharon, where the lily of the valley's sweet-scented spices filled and perfumed my life. And then I walked into the business room of the Proverbs, and stepped into the observatory room of the prophets, where I saw many telescopes of various sizes, some pointing to far off distant events, but all concentrated on the bright and the morning star, which soon should rise over the moonlit hills of Judea for our salvation. And then I stepped into the audience room of the King of Kings, where I caught a vision from the standpoint of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I walked into the Acts of the Apostles where the Holy Spirit was doing his office work in forming the early church. And then I walked into the correspondence room where sat Peter and Paul, James, John, and Jude penning that epistle. And finally, I stepped upon the throne of Revelation where all towered in the glittering peaks. And I caught a vision of him upon the great white throne and I was made to say, all hail the power of Jesus' name. Let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. I don't know who wrote those words, but I think they bear repeating. Now, there are only three eulogies of the Bible that I know by memory. I've given you two of them. And the third came about in an odd way, and I know who wrote it. But at first I didn't. When we lived in Dallas, a good sister, bless her heart, handed me a, 
a eulogy of the Bible. It was entitled, My Bible. I read that, and I was touched again. So beautiful to me. And I immediately took it over to the church secretary, and I said, put this in our bulletin. The, the good lady had signed her name to it, who gave it to me. A few minutes she came back to where I was, the secretary, she said, did this lady say she wrote that? I said, no, but she's typed it, you can see that, and she's typed her name to it. She says, didn't you know that this is the famous eulogy of the Bible written by Henry Van Dyke, the English rhetorist? Didn't you know that? Oh, I didn't major in English. I didn't know. But that secretary was able to save us lots of embarrassment. We were going to put in the bulletin with that lady's name to it. Later we found out she was a little emotionally disturbed, but it's really more than that, as you can see. But Henry Van Dyke said, Born in the East and clothed in Oriental form and imagery, the Bible walks the ways of the world with familiar feet and enters land after land to claim its own everywhere. It has learned to speak in hundreds of languages to the heart of a man. It enters into the palace of a monarch and tells him that he is a servant to the Most High God. It enters into the cottage of a peasant and tells him he's a child of the heavenly king. Children listen to its stories with wonder and delight, and wise men ponder them as parables of life. It has a word of peace for the hour of peril, a word of calm for the hour of calamity, a day of light for the hour of darkness. Its oracles are repeated in the assembly of the people and its counsels are whispered into the ears of the lonely. The wise and the proud tremble at its warnings, but to the wounded and penitent, it has a mother's voice. The wilderness and the solitary place have been made glad by it, and the fires of the hearth have lighted the reading of its well-worn pages. It has woven its way into our deepest affections and colored our fondest dreams, so that love and friendship, sympathy and devotion, memory and hope put on the beautiful garments of its treasured speech, breathing frankincense and myrrh. Above the cradle and beside the grave, its great words come to us uncalled. They fill our prayers with power larger than we know. And the beauty of them lingers long after the sermons which they have adorned have been forgotten. They come to us swiftly and quietly, like birds flying from far away, like a fountain breaking forth from a mountain besides a long forgotten path. They go richer as pearls do when worn near the heart. No man is poor or desolate when this treasure is nigh. As the trembling pilgrim makes his way toward the valley of the shadow, he is not afraid to enter. He takes the rod and staff of scripture in his hand and says to friend and comrade, goodbye. We shall meet again. And with that confidence, he walks through that lonely pass as one that passes from night into day. So I'm glad Mr. Van Dyke wrote those words. What will make a strong church? Only the right attitude toward that book. The Word of God, Hebrews 4.12, is quick and powerful, 
sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit, and of the joints and the marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Only the right attitude to the Bible will make a strong church. Only when a church believes, 1 Corinthians 2.13, that the Bible writers speak not in words which man's wisdom teacheth, humanism, but which the Holy Spirit teacheth. That's the distinctive. Humanism won't make strong churches. But that attitude toward the Holy Scripture will. Further, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction which is in righteousness, that God's man may be complete completely furnished to all good works. Second Timothy 3, 16 and 17. And really the way I started that reading, it's susceptible to criticism. All scripture is inspired of God. Now, most people who have read it, along with other verses, don't get a wrong idea at all. They understand it. But it's in spite of the way it was written, not because of it. For the translation does not get back to what the Holy Spirit said. Inspiration? Well, that's Latin. Derivation. From in and sparmo. And Latin in means in English also. Spiral means to breathe. So they made the word inspiration, an English word out of the Latin. Now look, see the difference now between what's recorded in Genesis and the way your Bible got here. There's a contrast. Look. I wasn't back there, but from what I read, I can see some clay being formed together, shaped. It's the Hebrew word for a potter that's used in Genesis 2, 7. And the Lord potterized man. We translate it formed from the dust, the clay. A pottery word, shaping dirt to look like what would be called Adam, but as yet, no, just a piece of dirt, that's all, dead dirt, that's all. Then what? It didn't stay that way. That corpus of clay came alive, how? Figuratively speaking, of course, just describing God's power, and God breathed into his nostrils the breath of, li- breath of life and man became a living being, a living biological being. That immortal soul discussed in other verses, but not there. Here, this clay became a biological being, a living being. But the thought about it right now, dead clay breathed into by the almighty result, Adam. A living human being. The Bible didn't come that way. It was not a collection of 66 books dead. Dead book. No. And then God breathed and inspired it, breathed into that corpus of dead books. No. No, no, no. That's not the way your Bible came. So scratch that part out. And get back to the way the Holy Spirit described it, and this would be it most literally. All Scripture, not a part of it, but all of it. All Scripture is God-breathed. That's the way it came into existence. 
It wasn't first a dead book and then made alive. No, it came into existence as the word of God. God breathed. Scripture is God breathed. So in the same figurative expression as it were, he breathed into these writers that we call the inspired writers by way of accommodation. He breathed into them. He put them in activity. So that they wrote, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but in words which the Holy Spirit teaches. Now, that's the only right attitude toward the Bible. And any other attitude leads us away from everything that's good and beautiful and right. Leads us away into that new morality that he described which teaches sex out of marriage, which teaches homosexuality if that's your life's preference, which teaches girls, if you're pregnant, it's your business, if you want to get rid of what's in your body, as a bad tooth, or an unborn babe, well get rid of it. Nobody can say you know it's your body and teaches euthanasia a beautiful word that describes murder. Now all of those things come when we get away from that right attitude toward the Bible. No way to stop if you go in that direction. Get away from that attitude. If you hold the right attitude you can't go into those things. The Bible that produces strong churches keeps us straight in morality all the way if we keep that right attitude toward it. That's not all. I've read two verses from Paul and one from the Hebrew writer. Now let's think about two from Peter which show the same thing. These beautiful words from his first epistle in the first chapter. Seeing then that you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brothers. See that you love one another with a boiling heart, fervent heart. Love one another with a pure heart fervently. Boiling is the word. Being born again, not of corruptible seed. What kind of Bible is it? Not a corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which lives and abides forever. That's the right attitude. Now all flesh is as grass, and the glory of man, humanism, is the flower of the grass. The grass withereth, the flower thereof falleth away, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word which by the good news is proclaimed to you. That makes strong churches. And let me stop there. Not only in the realm of morality is one led astray when he doesn't have the right attitude toward the scripture. But look, into the realm of what some people just call doctrine. It's all doctrine, really. But some call doctrine. You don't need to believe that Jesus was born of a virgin, they say. That really, you can be a good Christian without it. That's just the trappings. That's something exterior. That's not the real thing. Just, you just follow the golden rule and you'll be a good Christian. And you don't have to be worried about such a doctrinal matter as a little baby being born of one parent, you know that couldn't happen, so don't pay attention to it. But look, once you get away from the Bible idea of Mary being a spotless virgin and becoming a parent of a little baby, once that is put aside, look where you go. That means then that Jesus had two parents. They say, yes, that's really it. Now, if he had two earthly parents, then he wasn't the son of God. He's no more divine than you now are. And if he was just pure human, humanism, 
That's what they say he was. If he was just pure human, he didn't get out of the cemetery. And if he didn't get out, he can't get me out. So look, now I'm involved. And I don't want to stay in the cemetery. And you say it's just an outer trap, you're trapping the religion? No, it takes away the vitals of it. But I don't want to stay in that cemetery. The longer I live, life is sweeter. And I, I don't want to die forever. So the right attitude toward the Bible, the only thing that can give me comfort in the hour of death, the only thing. No other attitude toward the Bible can give me any comfort that hour. Then, that other passage from Peter in the second epistle, the first chapter. Knowing this first, 2021, 20, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For prophecy came not in old time by the will of a man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved, borne along by the Holy Spirit. What's Peter saying? Same thing Paul did, different language. But look at it. Again, the translation given in that way is susceptible to criticism. Knowing this verse that no prophecy of the scriptures of any private interpretation. Now that translation is used by the Catholic Douay version approximately. And they have a footnote that this verse shows that you ought not to try to interpret the Bible for yourself. You must let the church do it for you. Yours would be a private interpretation. So you must stay out of the interpretation business. You must let the priest tell you what it means, an official meaning. That's the way they look at that passage. And then there have been some gospel preachers misled too. And they have said that we do not interpret the scripture. We just tell you what the Bible says. We just preach it like it is. And that sounds great. But you cannot in hell, you can't prevent interpreting if you're a teacher. No way to avoid it. And it's right to do it. Only thing you've got to be careful about is the right interpretation. Now no one verse of scripture has two meanings. Unless God put through there as a prophetic utterance, double entendre, that's another subject. But generally speaking, one verse of scripture has one meaning, one interpretation. Now there may be a dozen misinterpretations, but there's only one that's right. And I found times that I was wrong. I thought I was right, but I was wrong, I'm sorry to say. I used to misuse 1 Corinthians 2 verse 9, for example. I have not seen nor ye heard, neither in the heart of a man, the things that God hath in store for them that love him. I used to read that and try to put it in people's hearts to make them want to go to heaven. And I don't think any harm was done, but that's not what the verse is talking about. I was misusing it. I was wrong. What about it? My interpretation was wrong. And good intentions don't make them right. Yes, you have to interpret if you're a teacher. Nehemiah 8, verse 8. You have the picture of Ezra on the pulpit of wood with other workers. And they opened the book of God and read in it distinctly and gave the sense. And some versions say gave the interpretation of it. You have to interpret. But you better be doing it right. That's the thing about it. Well then, if that's not what he's saying in 2 Peter 1, 20, what is he saying? Well, let's look at it again. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of anyone's own private or personal get-up. None of these men 
manufactured what he writes. It didn't come from the writer. Now he says that in a negative way twice, and then he goes to the positive. Those are the three things in these two verses. Two negatives, one positive. Look at them carefully. First negative. No prophecy of the scripture is of any man's own private get-up or origination. Or loosing it out. Luo, to loose it out. Let it come out. That's the first negative. Not that way, says Peter. No prophecy of the scripture is of any man's own private get-up or origination. Second negative. Prophecy came not in old time by the will of a man. That's the same, same, the same thing over. Just repeating it in different words. That Daniel didn't get it up what he put down. So those are two negatives. Now what is the glorious positive? If it didn't come of a man's own thinking, his own origination, how did it come? Holy men of God spoke as they were moved or borne along by the Holy Spirit. There's a positive side. That puts it in the right perspective. So he's not talking here about meaning of Scripture. He's talking about how it got here. How did the Bible get here? That's what Peter's telling us. And we rejoice in the fact that it did get here. That it is so solid and it can help us live a clean moral life and give us a hope beyond the grave. There's a lot more I had thought to say, but there's no end to this line of thought anyways. You know that book is so full, so I'll, I'll close it this time.